Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. Are you feeling trapped as a Christian in a crazy mixed up world? Maybe even feeling trapped by the trappings of the world's influence on the church. Then it's time to be rescued by truth. Pastor Chris Dodge's newest series in which he explores the truths against the lies. The enemy has altered our core beliefs with well-crafted lies, not just influencing us in our homes and communities, but yes, even in our churches. Join us as we open our hearts to being rescued by truth. And now here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. Good morning. God's blessings to you. Welcome to Awake this morning. We are going to come before God today for a time of worship and praise and reflection on his word. Before we begin with prayer, I'd like to share a word from scripture with you. This is from the, Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1, where the apostle Paul writes and says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We're going to be talking about freedom today, and we're going to be talking about the power of the gospel of Jesus, the power of God's word to deliver us from bondage to sin and death and the devil. So on that note, let's start with prayer. Lord our God, we thank you that you are the deliverer. We thank you that you have delivered us from the kingdom of death and darkness through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we daily appropriate that great gift and that great promise, Lord. Fill our hearts today with love for you, thanksgiving for all you have done, and a deep and abiding desire to share the good news with others. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, the title of today's message is Garden Antidote. And if you think about that word antidote, it's a really fascinating one. It's a remedy for counteracting the effects of poison. Last week, we took a look at something that poisoned the entire human race. We talked about the fall in the garden, our first parents succumbing to the temptation of the devil and rebelling against the plan and purpose of God. We talked about the faithfulness of God. Today, we're going to talk about the garden antidote, God's answer and remedy to counteract the effects of the poison of sin and death and the power of Satan. You'll recall that last week, if you were with us last week, if you weren't, welcome today. Uh, and, and you can catch last week, by the way, online. Just go to awakeusnow.com. But anyway, uh, last week we talked about the enemy's garden strategy to doubt the creator, to deny the consequences of sin, and to deify the creature, to make ourselves like God. And we talked about appropriating in our own minds and our own souls the truth, truth number 19. God is God, and I am not. But today we're going to go one step further. We've taken a look at the garden strategy of the enemy, but it's important for us to see that God has a strategy to win the final victory, both over sin and death, but also over the adversary himself. And so we come today to truth number 20. It all begins and ends in a garden. The fall into sin occurred in a garden. Deliverance from bondage to sin and death and the devil also occurs in a garden. And that's where we're headed this morning. And so we read John chapter 19, beginning at verse 41, where John the evangelist, an eyewitness both to Jesus' ministry, but also to his death on the cross and ultimately to his resurrection. Here is what John, an eyewitness, wrote about the events surrounding the death and resurrection of Jesus. He says, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. It's John who gives us that detail about Jesus being laid in a grave 
a tomb that had never been used before in a garden close to the site of his crucifixion. By the way, there is a church, one of the oldest churches in the world, located in the city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. It's known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It has been pointed to as the traditional site of both the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Those two sites were close together and both of them, according to the tradition, are covered by this ancient church. For those who would say, well, that's just a tradition, I will say this. There is a great deal of serious archaeological evidence and written evidence to suggest this is indeed the spot. Although quite honestly, because it's all built up, it just doesn't look like the way we would picture the garden and the garden tomb. I, I think that's why so many, including myself, are, are drawn for reflection at least to the garden tomb, which does not have the same kind of uh, archaeological and testimonial evidence supporting it, but it sure looks like the place that we would see Jesus being laid in the tomb. And it is on that note, then, that the scriptures tell us the rest of the story about what happened that morning. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 1 where we hear the account of the evangelist Matthew, one of Jesus' 12 apostles, as he says what happened on that first resurrection morning. Matthew writes and he says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Imagine what that must have been like that morning after all the events of the previous hours with the crucifixion of Jesus, the darkening of the sun about noon until three, an earthquake which actually ripped apart the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. After all of that, there's now another violent earthquake and an angel of the Lord comes down and the result well, Matthew tells us his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. You know, it has never been a fun thing to spend a night in a cemetery. But imagine the terror of encountering a supernatural being at the tomb of one who many said was the Messiah and others said was a demonic force in Israel. And now suddenly, here is an angelic being who glistens and glows and whose clothes are as white as imaginable. And at that point, we're told the guards panicked. They simply became so afraid, they shook and became like dead men. Uh, they experienced what we would today call PTSD. And... Uh, this was a traumatic event for them, but it's in the midst of that trauma that Matthew relates the following, verses 5 and 6. He says, the angel said to the women, because the women apparently arrive right about the same time, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And at that we are told, he says, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And that is Matthew's account, the opening words about the resurrection of Jesus. And I would like to suggest to you that in that account and in all that happened that morning and in the days prior, we see God's antidote to the, the adversary, to his, his wily ways, uh, to his garden strategy of doubt and denial and personal deification. God gives us 
his garden antidote. And the antidote that is laid out here in the Gospel of Matthew and in the biblical teaching about Jesus' resurrection is a powerful and life-changing one. One of the questions you and I need to ask ourselves is this. Are we going to live in the fear of the enemy or in the power of the resurrection? Are we going to live with the fear of guilt or the joy of forgiveness? Are we going to live with the tactics of the enemy or the purpose and plans of God? And so let's take a look at God's garden antidote, an antidote that was displayed beautifully in the garden near the site of Jesus' crucifixion and the actual site of his resurrection. Number one, what do we see the angels? What do we hear from them? Well, the guards are terrified. They're not people of faith and they weren't expecting anything like this. The women weren't expecting anything like it either and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, what? Do not be afraid. That is what angelic beings so frequently say throughout the scriptures. In the Old and New Testaments alike, do not be afraid. In Hebrew, it's al Torah. It literally means don't even imagine the things that cause you fear. And what the angel is telling the women, but also communicating to you and to me, is that we are not to live our lives based on fear. We understand that God is good. We understand that God keeps his word. We understand that God is the author of life, that God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And therefore, we resolve that we will live our lives not by fear, but by faith. And daily we are called to set fear aside and walk by faith in the living God who will complete all of his plans and purposes, both for the world and for you and for me. Number two in the garden antidote is to recall the Lord's words. In fact, that's what the angel actually said to the women. This is one of the things he said, Luke 24, verses 6 and 7. The angel said, remember how he, meaning Jesus, how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. The angel reminded the women of what Jesus had said. And by the way, in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, on three separate occasions, Jesus says this type of thing, telling his disciples what lies ahead. They didn't understand it at the time. But in that moment in the garden, the angel says, remember. Remember what he told you. Remember the Lord's words. For you and me, when we encounter things that are difficult, that are frightening, that are downright scary, that are painful, that bring sorrow and worry. It is important for us to recall the Lord's words, not just that he will be delivered over into the hands of sinners and be raised on the third day, but the words of the Lord who tells us that he will keep his plan and his purpose for you and for me, and he is with us. Recall his words. That is God's antidote. It's why you and I need to be in the Word. It's why we need to allow those words to take root in our lives. Rather than just simply having a Bible sitting out on a shelf or on a table, we're called to internalize its words so that the Word of God, the Word of our Lord Jesus, may encourage and strengthen us in the difficult days, as well as in the good days. The third part of the garden antidote is what the angel said. Remember. He is risen. You and I need to remember that too. We recall Jesus' words, but we also remember he has come back from the grave. He is alive. He is risen. Our God has won the victory. And that is at the heart of the garden tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. He is alive. We remember he is risen. And he is coming for us. 
and he is with us now. And that points us to the fourth part of that garden antidote, to rely on God's promises. I want to rely on what Jesus has said. I want to rely on what my Heavenly Father has directed and dictated. I want to rely on what the Holy Spirit testifies. To rely upon God's promises. Among those promises, well, Jesus said He will be with us. In fact, the Gospel of Matthew ends on that note. I will be with you always, He says, even to the end of the age. I want to rely on that promise. I want to rely on the promise of the Scripture and of the Lord Jesus who says He will baptize us with the Holy Spirit, that we will be filled with the Spirit of the living God. I want to rely on the word of truth that says keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to rely on everything that God has promised, that the final victory awaits us, that this life is momentary, but what is to come is forever. We rely on those promises. And that takes us to step number five of the garden antidote. And that is rejoice. He will return. He's coming back. We are living at a time when many believers and non-believers are like are frightened by what is going on in the world. And I have to admit, there are crazy things happening. We're living in a world that has lost all reason and has bought in so often to lies that are absolutely nonsensical, yet they are widely received and widely accepted. And it is natural for people at that point to throw up their hands and say, oh man, this is just going, this is going down the toilet right now. And what God says is, Jesus is coming back. And in fact, the very things that we see happening in the world Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, uh, the love of most growing cold. Those are the very things Jesus and the New Testament said would happen before the end. They're the very things the great Hebrew prophets predicted would take place before the final victory at the end of time. And we need to remember that. He is coming back. And so even when things look dark and bleak, I know that the daylight is coming. Even when the darkness seems overwhelming, I know the day will come when He will return with the very light of heaven and the angels of God. And that gives confidence and hope and peace and power to all of us who believe. The question again is, where are you going to live? Are you going to live in the garden of sorrow or in the garden of hope? Are you going to live in the garden of death and the enemy? Or will you live in the garden of peace and power and resurrection and life in the garden of God? Those are the things that God offers to all who believe. A garden antidote to the garden tactics and strategy of the enemy. And it's all about replacing fear with faith, recalling the Lord Jesus' words, remembering that He is alive and risen from the grave, relying on God's promises, and rejoicing in the knowledge. He's coming back. May that fill you with hope and with great joy. And if you're not yet His believer, may it point you to the only one who can answer the deepest questions of this life and to give assurance of life forever to come. God bless you, dear friends, and may the living God be glorified and honored in each of our lives as we receive His garden antidote daily. Amen. Would you join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, how we praise and bless Your holy name. We thank you that you have answered the deepest needs of our human souls by the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have fulfilled all that you promised through your servants, the prophets. And we thank you that the day is fast approaching when our Lord Jesus will return. Until that day, may we live in the garden of your promises. 
May we live by the power of the resurrection of Jesus. May we live in the strength that the indwelling Holy Spirit provides. This we pray in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's discuss these things, shall we? And to get that discussion started, I'll just ask the question, number one, which garden seems to receive the bulk of your attention at present? You know, where are you being drawn? Is it to the assault and attack of the enemy? Or is it to the promises of God? The gospel of Jesus, the good news of his death and resurrection, the good news of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the good news of the Bible, brings hope and joy and life. And that's where we want to be. Secondly, why is it important to live our lives in the strength and power of the resurrection? It's why the Apostle Paul says, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery, to the law of sin and death. Rather, yield yourself to the law of the resurrection, the good word of God that says there is life and hope and power and peace in trusting and walking with the Lord Jesus. And finally, how does this impact your walk today? I would encourage you to reflect on those things and to ask God, what do you desire me to do now in these last days? Well, I'd encourage you, if you haven't recently checked our website, or if you've never checked it, check out awakeusnow.com. There's a lot of other really good stuff there, and it's all free. We'd love to be able to share that with you. Now, let's receive what God desires to share with us, and that is the meal that our Lord Jesus first celebrated with his disciples on the night of his betrayal. The scriptures tell us that our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had broken it and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat, my dear friends. This is the body of Christ offered up for you and for me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, All of you drink of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink, my dear friends. This is the blood of Christ shed for you and for me. And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen us and preserve us in the faith until the day of Jesus' final appearing. May we be filled with his joy, strengthened by his Holy Spirit, and empowered by his word of truth. Amen. We join together in praying the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, my dear friends, may the living God fill you with joy and peace through the power of Jesus' resurrection. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. And if you're asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. We hope you will share this message with others, and please come back and join us again next time.